Hello, Silas here, back with my friend Steven. Say what's up to the peoples as per usual. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. We're back for part two of this conversation that we've been having on seed oils, oils, fats, and other nutritionary type of things that is part of the You Are What You Consume series. This is just information that Stephen has looked into and I'm just asking him some questions about the documents and things and his research and personal experience that he's had. This is not some dietary advice saying you have to switch to this or if you have this, it's going to poison you. This is the stuff that he's experienced, stuff that I've experienced, stuff that we've seen, and we're very open and welcome to hearing that things that we might be wrong, information that we might not be getting, experiences that y'all have, because chances are <laughs> the title of whatever we title this series is, if you click it and you've seen part one, and you, if you haven't, go check that out as well. But if you, you're probably familiar with some of this content and some of this information, I have some interest to do it. And part of why we're doing this is because we've gone out and found information that people shared with our interest and we're more than willing to be corrected and we want to actually get better information about this because you are what you consume, not just physically with eating the healthiest and most nutritious things, but also mentally to eat some of the healthiest and most nutritious things to feed your mind and build your mind up in that way. So Stephen, just give us a bit of an overview of what we've done so far and kind of where we're heading off uh, in this part. Sure. So I talked about how I went down this whole rabbit hole uh, regarding seed oils. Are seed oils bad for you? Is this overblown or w w where does the truth really lie? Also, I touched a bit on my own experience, how I've cut them out and I've been feeling a lot better. Um, I got into a bit about the origins of where did these come from, how these were, these were not natural products or rather industrial lubricants that became cooking items later how in the span of human history we've only eaten them in a very brief time because you think about it the last century and a half maybe which again in the span of human history is nothing um i talked a little bit about carbohydrates and some of the problems there i addressed uh you know what is the difference between saturated monounsaturated polyunsaturated and trans fats and then our last bit here was about Ansel Keys, who was the one who pioneered the idea that fat clogs your arteries and that if you eat saturated fat, you get a heart attack. And we addressed where he was wrong, where he was right. And then today we were going to start off with the section about inflammation and uh, toxicity with the seed oils in the arteries. Had some audio and connection issues with this one, so excuse us. I'm going to be adding these little explainers when possible. He was talking about how the first section was about the history and some of the way the research began. And then now we're getting into like some of the actual effects of what it has on the body. And like I said, these are things that are out there. And as Stephen mentioned, a hundred years is not really that long. It's not even just long for what science itself is, a scientific process of having the ability to collect enough data, to match, have enough knowledge about any field in general, to have hypotheses about what you might research, even, <laughs> even make some sense. You might be missing some very core aspects of it. So your hypothesis, is not, it's not even, it's a mad question in some situations. So we're still, a, a very relatively new industry of understanding what this actual thing can do to a physical being. And then when it comes to animals like we are, when they test mice and things like this, it's actually something, was that mice thing mentioned in this, that there was some issue with the mice? No, this was something I heard, I think, in the Dark Horse podcast. It was talking about like the mice that they used for lab rats, it's a bit of a digression, actually have evolved themselves in a selective population to not really be like average mice in nature, something to do with their telomeres and stuff like that. So actually all many of the tests that we're doing on these mice might not actually, might be spoiled in some way because you're dealing with like kind of a mutant species of life form, <laughs> some of those things. But regardless, most of the tests are done on just saying, oh, we're going to test this one mice mouse in its lifespan. Most viable test when it comes to reproductive life forms is normally over a few generations to see what's going to be the effect of this, in, especially when you're talking about genetics. How does it pass on this thing in genes? 
Here, think about epigenetics. Things turn on and passed on, and a small amount of something can turn it on, let alone when somebody's having the majority of their fats being seed oils. So we don't know what's going to happen like three generations down the line when you have people in that way. And from the little information that I've gained from it, I hope we don't get to three generations of people having majority of this kind of thing, especially in its current state. Maybe there's some things that can change the nature of what I think vegetable oil, oil seed oil seem to be. But um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not too... Um, it, it's not looking too good from, from my, my expectations. So the, one of the major ones I think I've had experience like this personally myself is the inflammation aspect of it. Some people attach it to things like gluten. Some people attach it to other things. But it's, 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 um, yeah, it, it's, it's something. So you can go ahead and I think jump into the, into the section. So the inflammation of arteries and how that might be connected or might result from uh, consumption of the type of oils and seed oils. So this section I titled, So Inflammation of the Arteries Leads to Heart Disease and Heart Attacks, Are Seed Oils Inflammatory and or Toxic? So inflammation is kind of one of these words that gets thrown around, and I should point out there's good versus bad inflammation. Because if you think about it, like if you if you get a bruise or something, it's your body's way of trying to heal the area. It's drawing more blood in, and that's you know delivering more nutrients, which repairs it. Like if you were to sprain your ankle to get hit or something. Um if you get a throat infection, same thing. It's drawing more antibodies and white blood cells to the area. So that's that's a good kind of inflammation. You know, uh, one person kind of made fun of the, how they throw around inflammation as a bad thing. And obviously there is good and bad. We should differentiate between that. Um, and Shanahan, the doctor I keep citing, she acknowledges this as well. So now the issue is that uh, there's inflation in places, inflammation in places it shouldn't be, but also it persists longer than it should. So what causes this? It's sugar, stress, injury, smoking, infection, various other things. In this section, I want to focus on the inflammation caused by types of fatty acids. So one way to look at this broadly is that omega-6 fatty acids are inflammatory, omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Cold water fish, grass-fed milk and meat are great sources of omega-3s. Um, and there, there's a lot of health benefits to omega-3s more broadly. Like there's one study that showed if a person has partial liver liver failure and they take fish oil, it will actually reverse the damage. Um, I've been taking fish oil a while, probably since I was a teen or so. Uh, Shanahan has some criticisms of fish oil. Her criticism is that some of them do oxidize to a degree. I'll get more on oxidation later, but they oxidize uh, during the process and they also lose their potency. So her argument is that if you're if you want omega threes, you're better off just eating fish directly. Like obviously, ideal scenario, you eat it closest to when it's caught and minimal or no cooking. I mean, obviously that's hard for a lot of people, but ideally that's the best way to do it because uh, you get the omega threes and they're closest to unadulterated form. Uh, we do need some omega-6s, however, but more omega-3s. So when I went to my friend's uh, raw milk farm upstate uh, a while ago, he was the one who taught me this, and he was saying how his cows are uh, grass-fed, and he was saying how that's a better mix of predominantly omega-3s and a little omega-6, which is what we want. That's why grass-fed milk and meat is better for you. Uh, many of these oils are high in linoleic acid, which is an omega-6. Now, again, you need some, but it's very hard not to get enough. Uh, one of the sources I cite down here said that uh, even people who eat junk food get enough uh, linoleic acid. And there was actually a uh, molecular biologist named Brad Marshall who went on a croissant diet. And he actually lost weight and had enough linoleic acid in his uh, adipose tissue. So, again, that's from eating one item. Now, I don't advocate a croissant diet, but it was just an interesting experiment. So... One issue is that linoleic acid is highly concentrated in these oils. For example, you'd need to eat around 98 ears of corn to get the linoleic acid you get in two in uh, five tablespoons of corn oil. And I thought this is crazy because like someone like my father loves corn, but I'm like, he doesn't eat Jeez. 98 ears of corn. He, he he eats that probably over a few years. Like that's not you know. Whereas this, it's like you have a few fried items. You have that you know in a short time. Um, Linoleic acid in adipose tissue cells has increased from under 10% in the American population to about 20% as of 2005. You know, who knows what it is now. Uh, Dr. Chris Kenobi looked in ancestral diets and found a Pacific Island group that is in great shape. Their linoleic acid rate is about 3.8% of their cells. Um, so he's one of the sources I cite as well. He's actually an eye doctor by trade, and he has some stuff about macular degeneration leading to uh, vision loss and 
apparently he went back and read all the old literature and he said in the 19th century and before as far as we know it was extremely rare like it was one in like a few thousand people or something and today it's become a more common issue so again what's the common ground um now, some evidence suggests that chronic or massive oh. consumption results in inflammation. Now, the study, the issue here is we don't have 20, 40 year studies on certain people. I mean, yes, we have studies on animals like uh, rats, but I mean, they've actually shown like rats, for example, who consumed a lot of olive oil were fine, but consumed vegetable oils died. Now, obviously, we're not rats, but still, it makes you wonder why is it the rats can eat this, they're fine, they eat this, and they die? It's like that should raise some questions. Um, yeah. Now, you you had mentioned this previously, like, you know, smoking one cigarette won't give you lung disease, but if you smoke for years or decades, that'll increase your rate. Uh, so the National Institute of Health did an experiment where they had people with chronic headaches and migraines go on a diet where they cut out seed oils and their headaches went away. Now, this was more effective than any, any known drug, and we know migraines are an inflammatory uh, thing. So it's like, it's interesting that they cut that out and that just goes away. So it raises questions. So how does bad inflammation emerge and develop uh well there's some you know we have to look at what free radicals are uh free radical it's a um i'm going to get into what a free radical cascade is as well uh did you have any thoughts or comments before i continue <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, it's it's more of like social commentary but we've been talking about um, the, the certain uh, movements and reactions and i can imagine i was, I was just thinking about how some people are actually not really that mentally free or radical in their in their thinking when when they actually talk about certain topics. It's like, no, actually, it turns out like, you're actually conforming to the way things are. And I think the when it comes to foods, there's a, there's a lot of that going on. There's some things that are considered. There's some like free information out there that is shared that is considered radical and against these kind of things. And you're like, why? This is this information that, why can we talk about this in a certain way? And yeah. there's some people who just want to limit how you can talk and approach certain situations. And we've discussed some potential of why there might be some investment into things being in a certain way in part one, or just how we've also discussed some people. Here is talking about the momentum of time, culture, marketing, things where you just take it for granted that this is the food that we eat. We've done it this way, I was raised this way, I've been marketed this way, or I trust the people who are telling me this is what I'm supposed to eat, while you believe that they have your best interests in mind. Even if they have your best interests in mind, that they know what your best interests actually are. Listen, that's something that, that we should not accept. Think about even most people in their own body, in their own cells, you're probably not eating the same way you were eating when you were a child, not just because of your metabolism, not just because of the needs that your body needs, but just the information that you have about food, the ability to access different sorts of foods and understand the preparation of certain things, certain choices and things that you make, the more information you have about that, chances are the better choices you're going to make from the choices that you have available. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So free, free radicals, this is citing from Shanahan's book, uh, Deep Nutrition. Uh, free radicals are high energy electrons that are involved in every known disease. They cause disease by restructuring nearly every molecule they come into contact with, converting biologically functional molecules into dysfunctional or even toxic molecules. Why would they do this? After all, the human body sometimes employs free radicals in order to perform basic physiologic functions like killing bacteria. It all boils down to a kind of loneliness at an atomic level. Again, I'll get into antioxidants and oxidation below, but like, you know, free radicals do serve a useful purpose, and like, so does oxidation for that matter. Like, uh, if you were to actually have too many antioxidants, it, it would kill you because it would disrupt certain processes that naturally occur. The, the, what we're talking about here is the bad mm -hmm. kind of free radicals, uh, what's causing them, and in the wrong places. So, the analogy she comes up with is imagine. Wait, a so this, you had some inquiries about the prefix of oxy, if it has to do with oxygen in your blood or something to do with that. Yeah, because the thing is, I mean, you think about it like we need oxygen to survive, and certain things do need to oxidize. Again, there, I'll do a section on it below, but like, um, you know, it's like you can't avoid oxidation, but the question is what's oxidizing, how, how does it react, and then if, if, there are certain processes that need oxygen to occur, and if you were to disrupt all of that, that would cause problems. Because it's like if you were to mess with it entirely in your body, you would die. Now, you'd have to binge eat antioxidants, or, and there's also antioxidants themselves are very broad and all that. So there is a certain balance that has to be maintained. But, you know, free radicals in general 
uh, especially caused through this matter, are a dangerous issue. So the analogy she uses here is what she says. Imagine a set of neighboring molecules in your cell membranes as a village of polyamorous communes in the middle of a forest in upstate New York. Uh, the elect the electrons who are members of the communes agree on one rule. We must always maintain an even number of members so that no electron will ever feel left out. Everyone should have a partner. Now imagine a circumstance where one electron decides to pursue an acting career and clears out one night without notice. Immediately, the unpaired electron it left behind goes berserk, racing through the halls of the commune, busting down the doors, breaking walls, and desperately disturbing the commune's essential structure as it desperately seeks out a new lover. The unpaired electron has been free radicalized, turned into a free radical. The commune now has two serious problems. Again, it's no longer the commune that it once was. It's been beaten up and rendered entirely unrecognizable. And two, because it's breaking the cardinal even number rule, it has, some, it has to do something about it. It chooses to solve the problem by passing the abandoned lover electron to another commune, letting them deal with this. Those consequences are predictable. Whether the newly introduced electron ousts another lover from his bed or fails to find anyone willing to partner with him, in no time, commune number two will have to deal with a lonely electron knocking down walls and wreaking havoc and forcing the commune members to hold an emergency meeting. Until such time that a patchouli wearing therapist antioxidants, such as a totally groovy vitamin E, shows up to say, Whoa, dudes, I'll take your extra lover. It's all good. I've got another therapist I work with called vitamin C, and like the whole even numbers thing will be totally restored. The chaotic process will continue leaving each and leaving each and every affected commune permanently changed, not for the better. So eating this and certain other foods will cause the electrons to separate. Again, the unpaired electrons freak out. They go through the different cells looking for more electrons to pair with. That damages the cells, and as that as that spreads throughout your body, that's what's damaging the cells. That's the free radical cascade. And a few of the people who talk about this say this is why these oils are dangerous because – they can cause that free radical cascade. So it's not just those immediate cells affected because they're unpairing some electrons in some cells that affect spreads to other cells, which, you know, spreads throughout the body until an antioxidant comes in and sort of restabilizes things. So if you were to have items that cause free radicals, like the occasional oil or something, but had plenty of vitamin C and E like laid out in this example, you'd be okay because the antioxidants would be coming in and uh, stabilizing this. But if you were to have, let's say fried food all the time, there'd be free radical cascades happening throughout your cells and long-term that's going to cause a lot of damage as we'll get into. Um, did you have any thoughts or comments on the analogy or concept? As, as you know, I like equating some, some things to like, I, I equate like human society as like, um, it's it's been created by humans. So it's the body politic itself also is kind of like a human. And I think we can all think of certain examples of certain people or individuals that do consider themselves free radicals, <laughs> actually do behave in this free radical destructive sort of manner. And I think that also does come in part from them personally not having a happy place in society with at least one or a few other shared minds. So they kind of project that and apply that to the rest of society. And one other thing, there was also, I keep, I, I know, I might look it up, but the difference between something that's toxic, I think it was like toxic and poisonous. So they were talking about the different effects of like some animal bites. One I think has to do with ingestion and it's how it affects your cells. And then one is like from the destruction of the cells, which I think the toxicity was the one that actually <laughs> destroys your cells in a certain way. So yeah. Um, so, yeah, interesting. This it's a good example. It's a good, it's a good example that can apply to a lot of things. I like that she picked upstate New York too. I wonder if she had a specific area in mind <laughs> where I was from. So, there are, there are papers. Sorry, what's it? So it probably does. There's 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 small little groups of of the sort in certain areas. I figured like New Paltz or uh, Woodstock or something. <laughs> so. All right, so let's see here. Um, there are papers showing that people who consume high seed oil diets feel nauseous, weak, and have low energy. Personally, I've experienced this. Like in one of the videos, they talk about like if you get enough sleep, but you still feel like you need coffee, and like you know, I've experienced that. They say this is likely due to the free radicals damaging the mitochondria, which are the powerhouse of the cell. Some scientists are actually see seeing a link between mitochondrial damage and diseases. That uh, the video, the $100 billion item making your food toxic, they have an explanation on this, 
So it drastically reduces something called cardiolipin, which your mitochondria uses for energy. And they mentioned in the video, I didn't know this either, that cyanide works so quickly because it takes down the mitochondria in your cells really fast. So if you shut down the energy production in all your okay. cells fast, that's what kills you. Your body doesn't produce energy, and then with no energy, the cells die, and that's it. Yeah. <clears throat> so conversely, again, people... People who consumed animal fats and olive oil didn't experience these problems. So if you consume seed oils for years, they break down into highly toxic compounds in the body. This can cause protein degradation, DNA damage, and they can mutate a gene which protects you against cancer. They've actually wondered if this is the recent rise in cancer in recent decades, if if that gene, that gene which is like a defense system, is turned off, well, your body's not going to fight cancer as well, and that's going to make you vulnerable. Um, the... The chemical attributed to lung cancer and smoking is called acrolein, which is an aldehyde, you know, formaldehyde. I think people know what that is. That's in the same category. It's been shown that smoking produces this in the body, and so does cooking with seed oils, not only from the ingestion, but also released into the air. They have linked this to lung cancer in people who don't smoke. When the oils land on clothes, they can turn into a flammable varnish, which burn down some laundromats. Apparently, there were stories of... Uh, Chef White soaked in uh, the oil and they actually caught fire because, you know, it's a flammable material and just like instinctively is this stuff you want in your body. <laughs> and um, in one of, one, of Shan one of Shanahan's videos I cite below, she actually lays out the various chemicals found in these oils when they're heated. And she mentions acrolein as well as others. Um, as heart disease is an inflammatory issue, many people think depression. So obviously arthritis, anything ending with itis means swollen. So uh, joint pains in general, headaches, etc. All right, uh, thoughts and comments before I go to the next section. Yep. Cut out some pauses here and trying to just collect my thoughts to an appropriate question. At least from, from your experience getting this information, this information has been available from when you started probably your whole entire adult life, right? It's yeah. been in there in culinary school. Like you went through culinary school, you've worked at restaurants, you've of course been buying your own food. I mean, your parents are responsible. Like this, this thing, what do you think is one of the main hurdles from understanding this information. People hearing this information and just here had a bit of a cough, but was asking Stephen, leading to asking Stephen about what he thinks the hurdles are to people understanding this information. Because if there's something that we missed, feel free to counter some of this information. But some of the stuff is just kind of damning for it to be there. Why aren't more people talking about this? You know, so many times people say nobody's talking about it. And I don't like when people say that statement. People are talking about this, but why are people who claim to be interested in the general health of people, why do people who claim to be interested in their personal health don't seem to seek out and absorb or spread this information? Is there something about it that you think um, prevents people from understanding? Or we, we've, of course, we've talked about the people who might be interested in the alternatives to this information, to these products, or profiting from the products. But just the average person, why don't you think they seek this information out? I, I think it could be a combination of things. I think it's just, you know, it's kind of that appeal to tradition, like, oh, we've always done it this way. Like, oh, I've been cooking with vegetable oils forever. So did my parents and grandparents. And um, given, given how long these have been in use now, I mean, as, as I said, in the span of human history, it's not that long, but I mean, it's been well over a century, so it's like, you know, you'd have to go back to your great, great, great grandparents, whatever, to see people who cook predominantly with animal fats and like olive oil and stuff. Obviously, those people are all long gone. Um, like a lot of things, I mean, you know, we've talked about how prevalent smoking used to be. And I think people just had this idea, yeah. like kind of like this is no, this is normal. This is what's accepted. And then once it started coming out, more and more people were like, wow, how bad is this? And I'm wondering, I'm, I'm starting to hope with the oils we're going to reach that point as well. And I'm starting to see like... Um, I saw Crisco recently was advertising uh, they were doing uh, coconut oil. So I'm wondering if is it kind of like I'll, I'll talk more in this below. But it was like when cigarette companies started walking it back a little and saying like, oh, we're filtering our cigarettes mm -hmm. now or this isn't as bad for you. or So it's like and I'm seeing, you know, like someone came into my job the other day and asked about uh, what kind of oils do you use? And of course, there's a seed oil scout, which they keep adding more restaurants to. So. I think gradually this this could this might even be like the early stages of people pushing back against smoking where it's seen as like, wait, we've always done this. What's the big deal? Then more and more people. And eventually it's going to be like, OK, this has to change. And, you know, I mean, I, I hope we'll get to that point and, you know, we may be on that way. But, you know, let's see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I think smoking is a better example because I was thinking maybe something like the laudanum. We used to take laudanum. It used to be like a regular thing or yeah. like children used to be given like rum on their on their 
gums to stop like when the teething pain and stuff. And some of those things were common. People were doing it uh, with the best meaning. But I think one of the differences is just, I don't know if they clearly did not have the internet and that access to this information that yeah. you've been able to find. Like other people have been, it's it's a bit frustrating, but uh, I guess it's more frustrating because of the options that people have to the access and people just choosing not to actually uh, take that access. It's It's, it's tough. Well, I'm glad, like I say, I'm glad to see things like the seed oil scout and like people keep adding to it. And like people are talking amongst themselves like, oh, I, I, you know, people writing reviews saying, oh, I talked to my server and they said we can do this. So if you come here, I recommend these dishes. Uh, oh, this company says they use beef tallow, but it's actually beef tallow and canola oil. Don't be fooled. So like, I'm just glad to see people communicating this stuff to each other. That's going to be a lot of hope. Yeah. 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 All right. So now I'm going to talk yeah, about now i'm going to talk about uh the oxidation issue and antioxidants all right so oxidation simply means reacting oxygen uh, everything is to a degree and can be avoided i mean if you worked in a kitchen you know apples and potatoes turn brown that's why you keep them in either potatoes it's in water in apples it's in acidulated water usually lemon juice uh rust is iron oxide i used to laugh because in the school they they sold this brown salt that said enhanced by the color of iron oxide and like i learned from my father that's just rust so they're trying to make it sound nicer than it is um so this changes the structures <laughs> the, the this this changes the structures of the fats and for the worse. So as we mentioned above, these polyunsaturated fats are very unstable and thus heat sensitive and prone to oxidation. The more saturated fat, the more stable it is. So again, beef tallow, lard, camel fat, all that stuff. Uh, monounsaturated fats such as olive oil, they do break down, but it's not as bad as with polyunsaturated because they have the uh, one double bond instead of two or more. Uh, so that's more spots for the ox oxygen to squeeze in and cause a damage. Um, one thing that was interesting, uh, Tucker Goodrich, one of the sources here he cited was uh, regarding omega, well, sorry, regarding polyunsaturated fats, including omega-3s. Um, he mentioned fish oil, and he's like, you think about it, fish oil goes rancid over time. Well, that's the oxidation effect. And, like, this is why we don't cook in fish oil, because if you were to fry chips and fish oil and then seal it up, you, you would open the bag, it would smell like rotten fish. Nobody would eat that. So evolutionarily... We're, we're sort of attuned to the idea of omega-3s going bad. That's why, again, you don't cook in fish oil. If, if Yeah, I remember letting fish oil sit out and it, like, smelled bad and, like, I wouldn't eat it. You throw it away because it's, like, it does oxidize. Had some knocks on the door, so just went and dealt with that and back to Steven. Fish oil does, um, does oxidize over time. Uh, but then a lot of the omega-6s, which are also polyunsaturated, uh, those are harder to um, identify the oxidation in because the flavor and smell doesn't really change that much. If you have uh, if you have omega sixes that sit out for a while, they get this almost like flat taste or something. Like I can kind of detect it, but it's like it's subtle. It's not like easy to notice right away. It's not like the fish, which obviously rancid fish you can smell right away. Um, and this is why a lot of processed foods rely on the omega sixes because. You know, if if that oil goes bad in those foods, it's less noticeable. Whereas obviously fish oil, you would notice it right away. Um, and this is why uh, avocado and olive oil, the good ones at least, are stored in uh, dark glass bottles because sunlight causes oxidation, but so does heat. So ideally, you store it in a cold dark bottle and close it, or also in a metal container. Like um, at my job, we have the uh, olive oil. It comes in in these big metal containers, and then we pour it in these glass bottles and Obviously, it, everything is going to oxidize over time, but ideally you use it up as quickly as possible so the oxidation is very low. Um, now, whole foods contain how about antioxidants. How them in the fridge? I'm not 100% sure how much that will delay it because they said store in a uh, cool, dry place. I mean, I know in the case of these, like the olive oil will solidify. I don't know if that will keep it any longer. Um, if anyone knows, feel free to interject. But I don't think I've worked anywhere that refrigerates olive oil unless it's mixed with something more perishable. Uh, but in general, it's like you store it in, again, cool, dry place like the basement or dry storage, usually away from light and heat. And again, if it's in a metal container or glass bottle, that's going to shut out any light. Um, so whole foods also contain antioxidants, which protect against the oxidants. So processed foods do not. This is the whole antioxidants craze. Like I remember at least since high school when it's like, you know, drink pomegranate juice. It has antioxidants. Drink mangosteen juice, antioxidants, blueberries have antioxidants, all that. And a lot of these things do occur in nature. Again, we mentioned vitamin C, vitamin E. It's just because the food has been so altered, a lot of them have been killed off or stripped out. Um, 
So this is why things like sunflower seeds in their natural state are actually healthy. So sunflower seeds, they explain, actually have antioxidants, which are designed to protect the seeds against the UV rays of the sun when the seeds are germinating. So if you think about it, there's a linoleic acid in the seeds themselves, but there's also the vitamin E and that protects if the seeds were to get exposed to sunlight, it would protect the seeds from damage. And then once they're in the ground, obviously they feed on water, they start to bloom, photosynthesis, you know, we all know how that happens. Um, but because they contain those natural antioxidants, that's why we don't have the same issues. So vitamin E, again, protects against antioxidation. You see a lot of these in, in the compounds with these fats naturally. In the West, a lot of people are consuming more and more seed oils, but they aren't getting the necessary levels of vitamin E. So notice some uh, seed oils are actually adding uh, vitamin E to the oils, although it's not clear that this actually helps. Uh, one study showed that vitamin C actually makes things worse because apparently the vitamin has a pro-oxidant and antioxidant role. They think that has to do with when it's heated, uh, whereas if you eat seeds in their natural state or even lightly cooked, it's not as bad. Again, I'm not 100% sure of the science, but that's one thing. Uh, and then vitamin C has a similar effect as well. So, for example, one study showed that a little bit of vitamin C with iron-rich items in the stomach actually exacerbates the bad reactions. Uh, but apparently a lot of vitamin C reduced the bad reactions. So, again, is it like the vitamin C overwhelms the linoleic acid versus if there's a little bit, it oxidizes and that makes it worse? Again, I'm not 100% sure, but that's there's some interesting stuff going on there. And... I think, again, producers are starting to wake up to this, uh, like with the cigarette companies, because I'm noticing in uh, stores, I'm seeing things like expeller pressed canola oil, canola oil that's high in, um, what is it? Uh, it's the, I'm trying to remember, it's the fatty acid found, oh, oh it's uh, oleic acid, that's the acid found in olive oil. Um, there's things like hexane-free produced canola oil. Hexane was that chemical they used in gasoline. Uh, to make gasoline, they use it in the oils as well. So I think like they're starting to shift away from that. And I drew the comparison. It was sort of like sort of like when cigarette companies started filtering cigarettes and things like that. Like they're not going to come out and say, "Yeah, we've been poisoning you this whole time, but don't worry, you know, this isn't as bad." Instead, they're just going to be like, "Look, this is better for you," and act like the previous thing didn't happen. So I think it's like again, it's like Crisco selling coconut oil. It's like they're starting to shift away. Or uh, Hellman's has a uh, avocado uh, mayonnaise now. So avocado oil mayonnaise. So I think it's like starting to shift away from that. And they realize people like me would be more keen to buying this. And then, um, you know, I mean, I guess over time, if it were to sell enough, they'd probably just discontinue the old ones. All right. Thoughts and comments. Yeah. Yeah. Someone was, was I saw somewhere, I think it was one of you posts. Someone was asking like uh, for any suggestions of like, Mayo, like mayo without seed oils, because in, in the United States of America, it's ubiqu ubiquitous. You find that stuff everywhere. So it's like, oh, you can't make mayo without seed oils. Like, no, people have been having mayo <laughs> before seed oils were created. Like, seed oils are not like something we've had around for like 400, like hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, so, with, with this, as we've discussed, some of these, there's natural processes to get to these things. I consider human beings natural, and the things that we do are natural. It's like, hill is natural, like a beaver dam is natural, then the that dam that broke in Europe, in Ukraine is a natural thing. Like it, when we look at ant hills having their wars and things like that, we say that's a natural part of nature. I think with humans, with their own issues, those are natural. We just do things on a different scale. So we can, we tend to be able to like break down things that out in nature without humans might be created through a long random scheme of things, but then we were able to tailor things to a certain way. And chances are, if it doesn't do that, if there's some things that naturally occur that have been selected for in a certain way that you can understand, like, okay, this has, has a stable status as what it is. And some of the things that we experiment with might have been skipped over because they're unstable or <laughs> lead to like negative effects through like the evolutionary process. And some of the things might be things that might come in the future, but we're still not creating any new things. But with that in mind, like you mentioned, there might be a possibility of humans adjusting eventually to some of these things that were once negative. Like I'm sure there's regular things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives that if you took like somebody from like Bronze Age Iraq and were like, okay, here, you eat like what we're eating, it would not do them well. Not even just the simple allergies where it's like beans or something. There might be certain 
elements of certain things that they're used to from the diet, from their experience in that one environment at that point in time in humanity, that if you have them subjected to what we're eating and consuming today, we're just like poison. They won't they won't be able to find the energy into it. There's there's some things and considerations like that. So with, with some of these, what do you think is the chance that we can adjust to these? Or why do you think there's a lack of some of these elements just coming out in nature compared to the animal fats structured as they are in nature that that question makes any sense whatsoever well I, well I was, I was saying like again it it was a combination of like industrial lubricant and like oh it's cheaper and you know it you can store it you know again it, like i said earlier it's not it's not a conspiracy it's just people acting in their self-interest and then okay procter and gamble can make all this money with crisco and then the American Heart Association's underfunded, so they donate money to them. So it's okay, we get the funding we need. And then, oh, look, we have a scientific mouthpiece that can say things that are going to benefit us. Um, and I was saying, you know, I think it was a coworker, like just the whole idea of, you know, you think about how our ancestors ate versus now. And it's like, again, these are so new relative to human history, but it's also like even the polyunsaturated fats we get, again, you'd have to eat in the past fish or nuts. And it's like, you're going to get full off the protein and other factors. And it's like, you're not going to have such a high level of polyunsaturated fats, especially uh, especially linoleic acid, because, again, it's like you're not going to eat 98 ears of corn. You're not going to eat, you know, pounds and pounds of nuts because, like, again, you're going to be full. So the fact that you're getting polyunsaturated fats, especially the omega sixes in such high amounts, it's complete. It's completely contrary to what we're used to. And that's what's causing all these problems. But again, it's like, because the last century or so, this has been normalized, like a lot of people just don't question it. And well, you know, hopefully more and more will now with these changes, but you'll see. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm wondering, like with, with something like corn, that's been, uh, it's been genetically modified by humans through the more average, like the longer term crop selection, not going in. I mean, now that the some companies like Monsanto and things like that have gone in. Now they can actually tweak the genes like directly under a lab conditions. But generally, bananas, a lot of wheat, a lot of staple foods that we've had in cultures, Stone Age cultures, all these things. From that time, they started selecting and breeding uh, certain certain like preferred to humans kind of traits. So, because I was trying to think, like, is there possibly an animal? That would be close enough to humans that actually also eats this, but it has some genetic ability to actually deal with that level. Then I was also thinking with fish, is there some sharks? But sharks are like <laughs> entirely sharks are weird creatures. They're entirely different creatures, and a couple of them have been eating human beings recently. But there's no shark that's going to like overeat itself to the point where I think whatever negative effects are you get from eating that much fish would accrue to a shark, but then the shark biology might be entirely and then whales, of course, don't eat fish. The whales eat plankton. So yeah, it's um, hmm. they, they, they just might be no reason until the humans came around for these elements to exist in the form that they do and be used in that way, especially as foodstuffs. Because um, like I said, they can be used for lubricants, and that still works. Um, hmm. Okay, what's what's carb liver oil? Like, where does that come from? Because I know cod liver oil is something that was considered generally healthy. That's one of the regular type of fish oil type of things that's considered positive. So I, I don't know what Shanahan thinks. One of the other sources they cited as like a very uh, good item. Um, I think, again, the issue might have been how the oil was handled because I see stuff like cold pressed or whatever oil today. I think the concern, again, is I don't know how bad the oxidation is. I think part of the issue is it may lose potency because, again, it's like it's best when you like catch the fish and eat it there afterwards. If it sits and sits and sits, that's when it starts to like lose its potency. Um, I don't know what Shanahan would say on that. Um, I, I've taken it in the past. Again, I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, I'd have to look more into that to really form an opinion. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So. All right, so I was going to get into uh, lipoproteins, lipid scientists, and myths about cholesterol. So in Shanahan's book, she has a very good uh, graphic illustrating a heart attack. I'll get into that a bit below. Uh, Shanahan, she relies heavily on the work of a late Austrian lipid scientist. His name was Gerhard Spiteller. Uh, I was reading he he actually died a few years ago, I want to say, um, uh, sometime after her book came out. Um 
So he delved deep into how li lipoproteins in the arterial system are affected by polyunsaturated fats as well as sugar. So here we're going to talk about lipoproteins, which are little blobs of fat wrapped in protein. They're designed to carry nutrients like cholesterol, fat-soluble vitamins, choline, etc., through the blood. So think back to the previous section about cholesterol types. There's LDL and HDL, low-density lipid, high-density high lipids. Uh, these are types of lipoproteins. So basically we're told HDL is the good kind, LDL is the bad kind. Prima facie, this is plausible, but it's a little more complicated. Now in Shanahan's book, she gets into how they're created in the intestine, they go to the cells, there's endothelial tests, which can test how wide your arteries are, how they're distributed, how the lipid cycle feeds your brain, et cetera. It's interesting stuff, but for this discussion, it's a little off topic, so I wasn't gonna get too far into that. Um, so for cholesterol, a test will tell you four basic things your total cholesterol, your LDL, your HDL, and your triglyceride value. So Shanahan pays most attention to HDL and triglyceride levels. So say, she says your LDL should be less than three times your HDL level. So, eight, so LDL should be no more than three times HDL. Uh, this combined with, cholesterol, with triglyceride levels below 150 shows a healthy body. Total cholesterol matters less if HDL and LDL are in the right ratios. So triglyceride... Um, is not a lipoprotein, but rather a component of all lipoproteins, both a LDL and HDL. But the majority is carried by cliomicrons, which is the lipoprotein your gut makes right after a meal, and very low-density lipoproteins, VLDL, which your liver makes from recycled fats. So most pre-diabetics and diabetics have high triglyceride levels. So the bottom line is you want to avoid foods that disrupt the lipid cycle and get everything in that right balance. So what causes this? Well, Spitella wrote about linoleic acid uh, oxidation in lipoproteins. The protein labels on lipoproteins are called apoproteins. Free radicals make the LDL unrecognizable by the LDL receptor. So they have different analogies. My analogy is think of goods moving along a conveyor belt. Think of that as the LDL. Think of the apoprotein, the label being like a barcode. And the uh, oxidative damage is essentially scratching the barcode off or smearing it. So when the items are going along the conveyor belt, as it were, LDL is traveling through your blood, your blood, your receptors can't recognize what it is because they're too damaged. And if they can't recognize what it is, they can't absorb the nutrients and carry everything into the body. So sugar, again, you know, sugar and the consequences, that's a whole other conversation. But she touched on here how uh, sugar causes glycation, which uh, gums up the apoproteins. Uh, in 1990, an experiment involving sugar showed these apoproteins, the barcodes, they became so unrecognizable to the cells that um, in, in 1990, an experiment involving sugar showed these barcodes uh, became so unrecognizable to cells that LDL stayed in circulation far too long. This would explain why pre-diabetics have high HD, high uh, LDL levels, sorry. So again, think of the goods going along the conveyor belt. If all the barcodes are scratched off, they can't identify uh, what's in the what's in the boxes. The boxes don't get scanned. Then you just have all these boxes piling up that are scratched off barcodes. You want to look at it that way. Um, so again, that's why if you give a cholesterol test to a diabetic person, because the cells are glycated, they can't they can't be recognized by the body. Uh, in, in 19, another experiment in 1990, it shows that sugar also interferes with an enzyme which processes these two lipoproteins. So the enzymes, the ends, because the lipoproteins aren't broken down between the apoprotein being wrecked, but also the enzyme not working properly. This explains why diabetics are hungry because all this LDL is circulating in the blood but not being absorbed properly by the body. So the nutrients and things aren't delivered. Now. Doctors tell us to lower LDL uh, to prevent heart disease, but this is a bit too simplistic. So Shanahan says that lowering LDL might reduce your risk of heart disease slightly. Um, and like, so she, what she does is she says if you were to take LDL at 150 and reduce it to 70, just this, nothing else changes. Uh, your heart rate of a uh, uh, heart disease rate of heart disease might go from 20% to 15, so 5% less, but nothing dramatic. However, if your LDL gets super low, it can actually cause increase your risk of cancer, infections, uh, hemor hemorrhagic stroke, and even death. Now, high HDL correlates with a low risk of heart attack. So again, if if your HDL were to uh, rise in this example, your um, your risk of heart disease might go from 20% to 2%, and your, your risk of the other diseases goes down too. 
So here's why there's all this focus on LDL. Uh, because there are drugs to lower LDL but not to raise HDL. And you think about this, you always see things like statins and other things introduced that will lower your HDL. We always hear, oh, lower your lower your L, sorry, lower your LDL, you know, that's how you get your cholesterol down. If your LDL is low, your risk is low. That's why they're always pushing this. And to me, this makes sense intuitively, because I mean LDL has been with us since day one. I mean, you know, you eat saturated fats, you're gonna get LDL. I mean, our ancestors have been eating this for a while. But the question is. Why is it that heart attacks and heart disease didn't start becoming an issue till about a century ago? And it's like, you have to ask, well, what has changed in that time? So the analogy Spiteller and uh, she make is, it's not the truck, it's the cargo. So, so lipid scientists like Spiteller, they conducted experiments to see what's inside the LDL itself. So the, the analogy they make here is think of the LDL instead of the conveyor belt, think of the LDL as being trucks going along a, high ray, a highway, think of, what's inside the cargo being the cholesterol, the choline, uh, the vitamins, all the other stuff we talked about. Now, he focused specifically on the linoleic acid, especially oxidized linoleic acid inside of the trucks. So he made the analogy, he, he made the point that LDL on its own is basically irrelevant, but the question is what has changed to the compound of your LDL itself that's made it so devastating? And the analogy that Shanahan and I guess he basically made is, think of the trucks containing the oxidized LDL as being the equivalent of trucks carrying fuel bombs. Well, what's going to happen? Trucks in of themselves going down the highway aren't a big deal. It's like trucks, if they're carrying like water or something else, a truck breaks down. Okay, obviously it's bad for that driver. It's bad for that individual truck. But as a whole, everyone is all right. But if the trucks are carrying bombs, well, that's the equivalent of these things being full of uh, oxidized linoleic acid and then essentially we'll get into how the heart attack happens but essentially it's a chain reaction of this explosion this explosion this explosion and then blaming the explosions on the trucks themselves it's like well it's missing what were they carrying that caused them to explode in such a violent manner and take out the highway or in this case part of the arterial system so um shanahan has found that people who eat lots of vegetable oils have low ldl especially if they're taking statins but will still suffer one or more heart attacks so I wanted to sort of embellish the firefighter analogy made in the previous section, how uh, one of the other books, they said, think of the inflammation in your arteries as being like fires and think of the cholesterol coming to deliver nutrients as sort of like the uh, firefighters coming to the rescue. If you're blaming if you're blaming cholesterol and heart attacks, you're essentially blaming firefighters for coming to the rescue for putting out the fires. The question is, one, why are the fires happening? And two, why are the firefighters getting jammed up in their job and uh, not able to do what they're supposed to. And I sort of embellish this analogy a little bit where they keep saying, oh, you have this diet, your LDL is lower, you're healthy. I'm like, well, that's like saying there's fewer fighters and no, f there's fewer fires and no firefighters were fine, but oh yeah, by the way, the buildings are falling apart and they're filling up with flammable chemicals. Well, all it takes is one spark, one idiot throwing a cigarette, whatever, boom. And then it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter that your LDL is low and that there's fewer firefighters because it's like there's going to be there's a it's a disaster waiting to happen essentially. Um, the size of the LDL also matters. Bigger LDLs are healthier because they're more recognizable to the body and do a better job of delivering nutrients. After which they go back to the liver and they get refilled with cholesterol and sent out again. Um, if the liver can't recognize the smaller depleted particles, uh, they're called remnant particles because the barcodes have been damaged by oxidation and sugar. They wander the bloodstream looking for a home until the oxidative process gets it to land on an arterial wall. Uh, now, there is a particle test size that can show you how big your LDL is. They say if they look like puffy clouds, that's good. They should be like that. If they're smaller and damaged, that means you have some of the issues we're describing here. Um, so in short... A diet with uh, sugar and vegetable oil, especially together, destroys these lipoproteins. The oxidation and glycation wreck the surface of the lipoprotein, which prevents them from finding the way to the proper destination. Uh, and Shannon made the analogy, it's sort of like satellites, their navigation system is broken and damaged. They start falling out of orbit and landing, in this case, on the arterial walls. And we're going to get into what properly, what the proper understanding of what causes heart attacks. Um, did you have some comments and thoughts before I jump into that? Well, this this is kind of one of those conditions that like, one of the main conditions, at least that you're in from overconsumption of anything, especially when you talk about uh, these fats, is obesity. That's uh, something that your body is actually in a state of like 
constant information. Part of the reason why people don't really, in general, find that to be as appealing as somebody who is slimmer and not as rotund and swollen is because swelling, as you well put, as you well put out, is a sign of your body dealing with an injury. And when you're constantly swollen, it looks like you're constantly injured. So there's even like a subconscious aspect of us, like you're supposed to pay more attention and avoid actions or people who are constantly injured or take care. So it's, there's something in there that people normally have to overcome in order to actually find that just generally attractive. It's it's in there. But um, I think with, with one of the things, I like that like the analogy you're using the trucks, so with this, it's also a situation you also mentioned with sugar being used, where we have diets and certain people have diets and lifestyles where they'll have an excess of something. Whereas maybe if you had a situation where these trucks were developing, let's say you can count those oils as fuel, even if it's uh, positive or negative fuel, you can say something like it's, it's different if you have trucks being shipped to somewhere. And then once they get to that location, the fuel is actually being used. You can say it's harmful to be in the trucks, but once it's at the location, it's actually put to use by whichever system it is. So you can say the body's actually doing it, using it. But when you have all these other things like sugars and these other excess calories, your body is using those calories instead of that. Then it's getting a stockpile of that oil that would have usually been actually consumed through your body and not as harmful. So there's also the connection of that where you can be physically fit and you have it, it's a comorbidity. The, the issues that come from this are more of a comorbidity than a direct thing where it's like directly going to kill you that way in, in that sense. So is, is that something you can you kind of uh, think of in this way? Well, yeah, because also a thing too, and I, I forget if it was Shanahan or that other book, but they made the point, like, think about it, like, Issues with sugar used to only affect the very wealthy because sugar was a luxury item. So it's like who could afford sugar if you were rich? It's only because sugar has become so abundant, so cheap and so potent that, you know, you can eat vastly more than our ancestors would have had, you know, over years, maybe. And then especially combined with this oxidative issue with the oils, again, they're not a product of nature. They're in so many things. You're eating these things together. It's like it's it's just like it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Like. I know somebody I won't mention who or where like I look at his diet now and I just kind of cringe. It's like all fried food and sugary stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, like he he has actually lost weight, like he started going to the gym. But it's like I was like, you're basically dumping super glue and like blow torching your arteries at this rate. It's like the amount like, yeah, you, you've you lost weight. And like, and, you know, and it, obviously it's good on him for doing that. But I'm just kind of yeah. like if you're going to destroy your insides, I mean, you could still get a heart attack the way you're eating. It's like I don't, I don't really see the point of this you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it might be worthwhile to come back and do um, and do and do a, one of these talks. Maybe a shorter talk, or even semblant talk on like sugars, because that's another thing. Like the corn syrup, corn syrup and corn oil. Like, <laughs> why are you getting two very separate things from that corn kernel? Like, the superior way to eat corn is on the cob, boiled, or like popcorn. Like, we're, we're trying all these other means of getting of getting corn into people's systems. Um, yeah. So with this also, uh, how much can this be prepared? We've talked about cigarettes before, um, the, the cigarette companies themselves. We've talked about fires, like fires can come in and destroy something. But normally, like that forest can regrow, like after these wildfires that are going on. You know, your house burns down, you can rebuild the house, you can save and protect something. But then there's some situations where if somebody like gets burns all over themselves, there's a certain extent to what can be done depending on the degree of the thing. So these effects that your body takes, is it simply just, after some time, you clear out these trucks with this uh, harmful oil, and then uh, you start getting healthier. What's kind of the process of uh, fixing the damage or the risks from from uh, consumption of these stuff, things? Well, it, it's funny because Shanahan mentioned several times in her books and videos. She's like, if I can give you any bit of dietary advice, it's just cut out these oils. And that that's that's kind of what I said towards the end of the last video. I think of like, look, I, you know, we're all adults. You can decide what you want to eat, but I would say. If you're having any of these issues we're talking about or you're worried, just cut them out and see how you improve. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you're like even if you're skeptical of animal fats, I mean, maybe cook some things with olive oil or like steak. You can just roast with some salt or like, you know, a lot of the Brazilian places do that or something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, and just see, do you do you experience an improvement from doing this? Because, um, again, it's like I, I don't hear of anyone who eats more vegetable oils and has better health outcomes. I mean, I don't think I mean, this is one thing I think. Everyone of every dietary stripe, like we all agree refined sugars are bad. Like nobody's going to tell you eat more refined sugars for better health. So I would say start with those two things and see what happens. I mean, that's just me. Um, she, you know, she gets a bit hyperbolic saying like 
oh, you know, these oils are, you know, the worst thing ever. It's worse than smoking. It's worse than the sugar. And like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm convinced they're pretty bad. Is it that bad? I don't know. I mean, some of this is also, you know, controversy and getting attention. But I mean, there, there is a case to be made for cutting these out or else, you know, I wouldn't be do we wouldn't be doing this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> She's also yeah. diving into it. So maybe sometimes when you delve into it, when you look deep into the abyss, it's kind of all you can see. You start kind of... Yeah. Your your deep knowledge about about the things is kind of more severe than um, if you were like just like <laughs> I just saw this random video that came up from 2013 where it's so, somewhere in China this, this car that kind of parks it looks like just like a regular street there's like kind of an Altima white Altima and then like it just parks and then some woman walks out of one of the sides goes to the other side the door opens and then they're talking and then like two cars kind of pull up behind them and then. The woman kind of looks back, and the tiger comes out and grabs her and pulls her back. And, and then, like the the driver jumps out, the man, and then the the mother kind of comes out of the back seat, and she runs away. They run off screen, and then you see this kind of um, safari's Land Rover come in. Apparently, it was at a park that they have in China where you can drive through the park in your own personal cars. It's like big cats and all sorts of other pre like creatures and predators things things out there, and they have signs saying. Please don't come out of your car. Value your own life. Do not come out of the car. And the daughter was the one who was grabbing the mom, and the, and the dad, I think, ran to try and save her, and the mom ended up getting um, ended by a different tiger. So that's unfortunate. But she was suing them for, like, uh, I think, like a couple million dollars equivalent, saying she wasn't warned enough about not coming out of the car. I'm like, some things you don't need to research deeply to understand. <laughs> I should not come out of a car when this tiger is around. Like, no one thinks the tiger is the same as, like, a house cat. So you can understand that level of danger. And the more you understand about what tigers are, I think the more respect you may think, okay, the tiger is the most terrifying animal because you've researched that. Maybe you lose, you lose attention of others. So maybe she's in that situation where she's researched this so much that she's seen all the negative effects about this that she hasn't really um, seen the negative effects from sugars, negative effects from smoking, negative effects from alcohol, or other uh, drugs and things that we ingest in our body. But I think from the information we've seen, it definitely seems to be on the highest end. I, I can attest to that as well. I still have yet to find somebody who stopped doing something like this on, on, this, on the seed oils in particular, and has said they were feeling less healthy. I mean, there might be a connection to other things, but yeah, I, as you mentioned, I think, I think pretty much everyone that we've talked to has done this has indicated at least some positive health effects from from doing that so there's something in there yeah because 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 like i said in the previous video like you know a lot i mean i've, I've cut out drinking a lot and like some people have said like oh maybe the positive effects are from that and like i do i do concede that to a degree i mean losing weight getting better sleep but the question is why is it when i cut out the oils my desire to drink like evaporated and then like it was then it was like i don't feel like i need a beer after work and then like my mood improved and stuff and it's just like again it was like christine was trying to get me to cut back drinking for a while but i didn't i didn't cut it out till maybe almost a year after i started dating her and then it was like you know I, that was the only recent change around that time so like that's too coincidental to be you know to say there's nothing there it just doesn't add up for me yeah, yeah that's one of the challenges that we have uh, in some current timeline is how do you test some of these things there's some limitations yeah. some very logical limitations of human testing but i wish there was some kind of setting where you could just say okay these this is what we need to test can you opt in now it's tougher because as we mentioned with this generational thing like you want to test some of these things someone have people like you have somebody three kind of similar people that you studied since they were now how young can somebody opt into this thing if an adult opts into it and says i want to study this like their kids is it is it uh, moral to also study the effect on the babies that they have in me like where's the actual um the actual ethical aspect of this, but to see is what's the difference. Have these people who have pretty close, even you can get a thing where you, this, now we can talk about cloning. Is it going to be possible to clone a human body that is genetically you without the brain and without the conscious, without the sentience? So you can say, okay, it's not a conscious being. So you can test like, okay, these are your, your five different bodies. This body has been subjected to alcohol, oils, sugars, um, tobacco and throwing something else in that with like no exercise and this body you, you start off all those bodies with that then with each body you cut off one of the things and see is this effect across because that would be the only way to really tell some of these things and maybe you can 
create um, computers or algorithms that are yeah, that's that's too far to create something that's actually advanced enough to simulate all these things. But there's there's some reachings with that. So I don't know. It, it, it's a tough situation. But as you mentioned, one of the positives of this is if you're taking seed oils personally, there is 90, not 90 I'm pretty sure 95% chances if you're somebody who's living in a place that you listen to this and you're eating seed oils, that's your major things. There's alternatives for you to find things. It might cost a bit more. You might have to drive a little further. You might have to apply yourself and have things shipped to you in order to substitute those things. There might be some things that you consider little treats or things that you like that you might need to kind of stop until you find a different option or you can find something that substitutes that in some way. But this is something that anyone who's doing it, chances are they can try it out themselves. Just cut that out, do everything else in your life the same way, stop for a week, a month, and see if you actually have any positive effects and, and come back and let us know. Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned cloning too. I was re-watching uh, The Boys from Brazil last night. I don't know if you ever saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it, it was it was it was pretty interesting. Well, I mean, it's like it was interesting because it's like you know the idea of like cloning, cloning Hitler and trying to like okay. create like yeah. Oh, I think it I was might have seen this shows for it. I mean, some. Hmm. Does he grow up to look like Hitler in the in the movie? Well, well, it's it's basically all these clones in different countries, and it's like all these different boys. Like I think like the Scandinavian countries, oh, wow. Germany, Austria, <laughs> and and the idea, but the idea. The idea was that they had the boys raised in families similar to Hitler, like an abusive father, doting mother, father's older, and they're trying to like recreate the environment as well. Okay. And and uh, you know it's it's Joseph Mengele basically like after he escaped, like trying to like bring about the Fourth Reich and all that. And uh, what's interesting though is that Bruno Gans, uh, he played the doctor who explained the cloning process, and he was the one who played Hitler in the movie Downfall, uh, Der Untergang. <laughs> like you've seen all those parents. So like <laughs> well, well, it's it's just funny because years later, it's like he goes on to play Hitler himself, and uh, it's actually the only German-speaking portrayal of Hitler because everything else is British, Canadian, American, because obviously it's still controversial today. Uh, but he's Swiss, not uh, not Austrian, though, so it's interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good movie, that downfall movie. It's it's pretty well yeah. done. Um, but yeah, this this sounds like a good movie. I check it, might check it out. I like I like the stuff with like the cloning and stuff it, like transhumanism that some people some people shirk at, but I'm 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 all for it if, if done with the uh, within the the dots of or like within there's certain more moral and ethical questions about it, but I'm I'm not like oh it needs to be banned completely. Yeah, and it, but it was interesting. It's interesting too because even in the movie, they sort of get into some holes in the plan. Like, how would you create like the world Hitler's World War One experience and yeah. you know stuff like that? Um, it, it, it's interesting uh, thought though. Anyway, back to this. Yeah. Um, uh, so heart attacks properly understood, plaque stability. So again, a lot of people believe that cholesterol builds up like oil clogging up in pipes. And the idea is that, you know, it's it's like dumping oil down a drain or something where it solidifies and then nothing gets through. It blocks and that's what causes the heart attack. Again, that's a misconception. Um, Shanahan and others make the point that your arteries will also widen over time. So even if fat does build up, your arteries will often widen. Um, you also grow new arteries. Old ones will get sealed off. Uh, that's just a biological process, especially as you age, as well as if you work out, because more muscles are fed by more arteries. So your body will grow new blood vessels because your, bo your body wants to re heal itself. Again, the question is why, why, uh, what's interfering with that or, and why is the damage occurring? So a single lipoprotein doesn't clog your arteries, but if they're damaged in a way explained in the previous section, they will start to build up, which will cause what I'm about to describe. So think back to the free radical cascade described earlier, uh, the electrons being unpaired and then ra you know, ru rushing through the cells, destroying everything in their way. Um, the damaged lipoproteins containing the oxidized linoleic acid land on the walls of the arteries and inflame the natural healthy cells, which spread from cell to cell. Over years, over the years, the damage can become so advanced that during open heart sur heart surgery, the arteries look like fried chicken. This will cause the arteries to rupture and bleed. The body will then attempt to repair the damage. Now, if the blood clots improperly, uh, this is forming plaque, which I'll explain in a sec, uh, and plugs the arteries. This will cause a heart attack or stroke, depending where it happens. If if it's the clot, the improper clotting happens in the brain, that's a stroke. If it's in the heart, that's a heart attack. Now. 
I, I notice if you experience either one of these, it's actually caused by a blood clot, not fat blocking the arteries. So, like, I, I learned this a while ago, but I'd forgotten that when ER doctors treat uh, a stroke or heart attack, they inject you with a clot buster, not a fat buster. So it doesn't dissolve fat. It actually breaks up the blood clot. Uh, so what does plaque have to do with this? Your body does want to repair itself. If you're healthy, your body will repair the arteries um, with a matrix of with the matrix of protein, cholesterol, and calcium. If done properly, this will build your arteries back stronger than before and protect you for the rest of your life. This is called stable plaque. So one comparison I was making was that when I was a teenager, I broke this finger here. So my left middle finger sticks up a little bit, but that's because the bone grows back bigger and stronger. It's the same thing with your arteries. Like your arteries can get damaged, but if you clean up your diet, they'll build back bigger and stronger because the idea is they're repairing themselves against future damage. Again, the question is, why are they damaged in the first place and why aren't they healing in the way that they're supposed to? And um, stable plaque holds as long as your arteries don't suffer inflammation, which can cause the plaque to weaken and rupture. This is called unstable plaque. And if it spreads over broad areas, it can be called buttery plaque because it's not hard or it's not thick or hard. So it's more prone to rupture. And regarding the uh, uh, there's a picture in her book. It's in black and white, but they show what they call it a French fried artery. You actually see an artery damaged by the uh, free radicals from the oils over time. It's like it's pretty, pretty scary to think, like especially if your insides could end up looking like that. So plaque can get so thick you can see it on an angiogram. If a cardiologist you see this, they'll typically recommend a bypass surgery or stenting. However, the reality is that one section of plaque isn't the problem. It's likely a sign that your your arterial tree is damaged and the problem exists elsewhere too. So again, it's like picture like a root a root system on a tree uh, with a disease. The weakness isn't going to be one spot. It's going to be in multiple areas. So maybe one spot will show up easily identifiable on the angiogram, but it's likely if it's damaged there, it's damaged in other areas too. And when one of these issues happens, you don't know where it's going to occur. It could be in the brain, the heart, arm, leg, whatever. And it's kind of scary because there's just the chance that it could happen anywhere. So I, I sent you that uh, the heart attack comic. I wanted to walk through it step by step. Um, again, we can show it up on the screen when we're doing the video. So here's what here's what we have here. It's this little uh, cartoon. So a degrade. So it basically shows um, the different cells sort of characterized with, you know, faces and stuff. Uh, the oxygen the lipoproteins going through the cells, the endothelial cell, which is the cells in the artery walls, the degraded lipoprotein, which has mega trans fat and the collagen layer of the arterial wall. So the uh, degraded lipoprotein attracts the white blood cell. White blood cells are meant to kill bacteria and other things that don't belong there. The white blood cell kills the um, ingests the depleted lipoprotein, which in turn kills the white blood cell. Um, this overwhelms the white blood cell. Pro-inflammatory enzymes leak from its body into the tissue uh, out onto the arterial wall, which weakens it. The inflammation attracts more white blood cells because the other white blood cells pick up that a white blood cell is dying, so they come to try and uh, clean up the issue. However, the pro-inflammatory enzymes continue chewing through the collagen, creating a soft area in the arterial wall. This is the unstable plaque we talked about. Uh, oxygen reacts explosively with the mega trans fat, as she calls it. Oxygen molecules and mega trans um, with identical spin states meet, they react and they explode. This dislodges the endothelial cells, the cells in the side of the artery, uh, exposing the underlying collagen layer. Wisps of collagen dangle into the bloodstream, which attract platelets. Uh, the dis dislodged endothelial cell knows that there's trouble ahead. Uh, the free radical reaction continues. The free radical cascade spawns more and more mega trans, which, you know, uh, they match the state of oxygen uh, present in the bloodstream. Again, we need oxygen, but because the the radicalized uh, the free radicals are reacting negatively with that. That's what's causing the free radical cascade. The explosion, as it were, becomes more powerful. The collagen layer is damaged, weakened more and more. So this has triggered the gathering white blood cells to release the collagen destroying enzymes to prevent collagen from leaking out into the blood and poisoning you. The platelets must coat the collagen layer before the enzymes so weaken the supporting arterial wall that it breaks completely. Uh, worst case scenario, the mix of pro-inflammatory chemicals generated by the gathering white blood cells would be exposed to flowing blood, creating an enormous clot. If this is an artery in the brain, it would be a stroke. If it's in the heart, it's a heart attack. Let's hope the playlist can clot the area in time. 
Now, today is not a good day for this person's blood vessel. The unstable plaque has ruptured into the bloodstream, and pl the pro-inflammatory mixture will now generate a sizable clot shown in the next frame. So there's no test to see if your arteries contain unstable plaque then that can lead to this kind of clot. Uh, the commonly performed angiogram only shows narrowing the results from a buildup of thick, older plaque. Stable plaque has been hardened with a matrix of calcium, protein, and cholesterol and is therefore unlikely to rupture. However, if it's healed improperly like this, this causes the blood clot, which again is the heart attack, stroke, or whatever. Um, I think this was a very clear explanation. It was nice. You know, she puts faces on the cells. You can see sort of the chain reaction. So it's not as simple as, oh, the LDL building up in the cells. It's what's what are the LDL releasing? How does the body react? And how does that set off the chain reaction? Uh, did you have thoughts or comments before I get into some other stuff? There'll be links below to the comic for you all to check out and see that, or you can pause it when it's on the screen there as well. But yeah, it's, it's, it's handy to have these kind of informations. I know personally I'll have to go back through this document that you sent me, some of these details, probably also re-listen to this both when I'm editing and also getting clips after to have some of this information really sink in. Some of the things I'm familiar with somewhat, some of the things been a while since I've had like uh, a class with these. I remember in high school having some of these things, even taking biology and in college with some of this. And of course, just over time, I came and I like Evo Psych, so I'll, I'll dabble into different things where some of these things come up. But yeah, this is important knowledge about the way your body works. So it's it's stuff that's um, that's interesting to actually, it's interesting and actually important to actually uh, learn about. It's rather than some of these things that were, that we might, that might take a lot of time where people are like, yeah, deal with this first, then you can add some of those other things. The situations where I'm like, why are you worrying about this? this nebulous kind of issue when you haven't handled this personal thing about, about yourself. So it's, it's kind of, kind of something to think of. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's good too, because I think, um, you know, she explains it very clearly, but it's also like pushing back against what we're told. And also, you know, hopefully between this and all the stuff we're saying about oils, it'll get people to think about, uh, you know, what really causes a heart attack and how do you prevent this? <clears throat> yeah. Cause you know, heart, heart attacks and heart disease are still, the number one killer in uh, America, right? In the first world. Yeah. And, then, and, and, that, that, and that was that was the argument I was having with somebody where they're saying like, oh, you know, the problem is saturated fat, lower saturated fat. I'm like, well, we've been following these guidelines and heart disease is the number one killer when it used to be mm -hmm. rare back when people were cooking in lard and tallow. So, you know, it just doesn't, just even prima facie, it doesn't really hold water. Yeah. And I know there's, there's an issue of like what's being tested in the right kind of way. Like <laughs> we know at the start of the recent pandemic, there was some issues where people were like, are you talking about this as the primary reason they died? Or is it like they happened to get this when they had all these other issues? And that was considered conspiracy theory, taboo, trying to kill grandma and back then. But then now the Fauci's of the world have come around and said, eh, you know, maybe we're, we're being a little too tough on these numbers. And maybe we're tying people down who had comorbidities and they just happened to get this and this took them out. There's, there's that aspect there. And then, of course, there's a number thing. Anybody, to me, who quotes the U.S. numbers, even considering all these other things that are in there, and China's numbers at the same point, and then someone like Kenya's numbers at the same point, like those three different countries are actually have the ability to collect and check on the populations based on the same data, even if you discount how different the actual biology of the peoples that they're testing are. Some people will test for certain things that in another place would be considered. But even if you consider all of that, there's just fewer people in like developing countries with pretty much like pre close to Bronze Age sort of like pre-industrial lifestyles that die from heart disease. They'll, they'll die from other conditions, like they'll get malaria and die because they don't have access to just like some anti malarials that are just common in the United States of America. They might get some worms and from eating some food that's not prepared in a certain way and then die because they just don't have ivermectin and they will be able to like actually deal with that in that situation that Americans are like poo-pooing and throwing away like this is for worms. So they might have those kind of things, but um, there definitely is an issue. Also, you might say the stress. You might say they have a more stressful lifestyle in the United States of America than they do in certain places. So maybe that's why these lifestyle sort of – because I think heart disease is – is heart disease considered a lifestyle disease, a lifestyle condition? That's a good question. Um, 
Because, I mean, you figure like diabetes, you could argue it is, but there's also a genetic component. Like we know someone with type 1 diabetes, but that's genetic, whereas type 2, it's people who eat too much sugar and vegetable oil and live poorly. So my my mom had gestational diabetes when she was pregnant with Will, where she had it only when she was pregnant. It went away after. So I don't know if that's a genetic thing or, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure. Yeah, so th- there might there might be certain things um, that are in there, and another thing that might be considered is like as I mentioned, some of these other things will have somebody in a developing nation without access to certain medical care kind of be taken out or not make it to advanced age. So some of these heart disease these people might just be people who are physically more prone to getting certain diseases that in a first world country would have had the medical care to survive those in their younger years. So once they get to an older age, they still have um, a higher propensity from passing away from some of these conditions. But you can also look at the younger people that have this. So it's there's definitely a connection. It's a correlation. Uh, the causation is there's there's enough information out there to to think the the, the causation is something to really pay attention with. It's definitely a lot more direct, and I think there are there are some internet. I know we're mentioning how much of this information is. I think you can look and find some heart, some international people who are very interested in in heart disease. But I'd, I'd say it's less than something like with climate change, <laughs> and the the questions between climate change and the effect of what somebody in the United States of America is going to do by reducing their carbon footprint when. 500 people in China are ramping their their carbon footprints up to like industrial age level of like one one person in the United States of America. How much is that going to offset, especially when it goes to the sky and like, it's all over the planet? Things. Mike was bouncing around too much to clean up here. So this was just a ramble. I think we're all pro-human flourishing. Most of us, pretty much all of us. Even if you're in the process of ending a life, yours or somebody else's, normally you've reasoned somehow in your mind that that is for the greater human flourishing of the world in general. Sometimes it's, it's your own and things like this. But what can you personally do in your own life that doesn't demand other people do things first? Yeah. Well, yeah, because I, f- I find like they, some of these sources, they've talked about some of these like indigenous or far off people who don't have these issues like near where you're from. There's the Maasai. Um, they talk about Inuits. They talk about civilizations in the South Pacific, all this. And the argument against like if you're like arguing against our position, the defense they use is something like, well, they don't live as long. And that's true. But then again, someone even made the point like they they, they kind of refuted themselves because they're like, well, they die of parasites. They die of malaria. Yeah. I think with the Inuits, they're actually heavy smokers because they started like so it's like we all we all know we all know those things will kill you. But the point is they're not getting heart attacks and heart disease. So it's like. You can have both. Like if if you you can eat their diet, but then if you don't get if you don't smoke, if you don't if you make sure you're getting water from like sanitary places, all that you can sort of take from both worlds. And I know with the Maasai, they're also very physically active. Again, that's something Americans especially need to do more of. So you know it's it's safe to say that their diet is healthy, but it's also the physical physical activity. And we and you know we figured out what causes the other stuff. It's not like okay, I'm not advocating go out and live their lifestyle, but at the same time, it's like if they're super lean and they don't have heart issues, well, we know what causes that too. Uh, now, again, as far as longevity, that's a little more complicated, but if it's things that we've resolved, it's like, well, it's a moot point because it's like, if they resolve those issues, they'd probably live even longer too. Uh. Yeah. And with longevity, one of the things is one of the statistics that I think bears repeating uh, constantly because I see it brought up a lot and not mentioned is when it comes up to uh, like how long, like the age, what's it called? Getting the actual term for it. What's the term they call like, the life expectancy? When they talk about life expectancy of every group, they also account like some countries will have somebody who passes on during birth. That's so, okay. That doesn't count as a life. Some people, some countries will wait until two, two, three weeks. If somebody passes on that time, they don't count it as somebody who was born. It's like somebody never actually was counted towards the life expectancy of that culture, but the, of that culture or of that group that they're counting. But most of the figures that actually drop things down are deaths in and around birth. Some people will actually consider, for some reason, the last trimester is actually or in the process of giving birth and they pass. They'll count that as like negative or as a zero towards the the um, life expectancy of that group of people. But then some people won't consider it at all. So that's that could adding one zero or not having it at all on the thing. That's going to greatly affect the numbers of those people, even if you have a situation where two groups of 100 people, one country one country counts 
deaths at birth as zeros. The other country doesn't count them. And then both places have 10 people die at birth. Then the country with the one that counts as zero will be a lot lower, even if every, even if the 90 people that actually were alive all lived to 90. If that makes any sense, <laughs> just because of yeah. the previous, but yeah. That's one of the things to consider. So those are, those are things you should consider when you're looking at some of these de details. And personally, I've made the mistake historically to look at a lot of information where certain information is presented to me. I may not understand it in a certain way, or I might go look at research myself and have part of it, and that kind of can fall into probably some bias or some limitations I might have in how I approach certain topics. Yeah. Sure. So the, so the cholesterol guidelines have been uh, revised a lot. So like we notice they keep lowering them. So years ago, a total cholesterol of 300 was fine. The level for health, healthy LDL went from 200 to 160 to 130 to 100, now 80. And it's estimated that the revision puts uh, – puts um, people between 45 to 70 at high risk, which of course the drug companies are happy to take advantage of. Um, that's why they keep pushing statins. Like I've heard some anecdotes, again, it's not super scientific, but I've heard stories of like people who've talked about their cholesterol is high and the doctor seemed hell bent on putting them on statins and then they lowered their cholesterol and they like almost seemed disappointed. And it's kind of like, why did you really want me to go on a statin? And it seems like this is what we've been talking about, about corruption in the medical industry and like our doctors getting kickbacks for pushing all this. I don't have hard evidence of that, but I know like, you know, we talked about all the stuff with COVID. I know during uh, last few decades, there was stuff about psychiatrists basically peddling for drug companies and like pushing for people to be on meds because they got a kickback. So, oh yeah, your child's acting up, take this drug. It's like, oh yeah, because we get a cut if you get them on that. So, it, you know, it makes perfect sense. Um, the, and then this is Shanahan again. The war against cholesterol is not without casualties. Women with lower, the lowest cholesterol levels have five times more premature births than women with higher levels. Even when carried to term, babies of mothers with low cholesterol are often born smaller with abnormally small brains. Remember, epigenetic alterations can accumulate over generations. So when these small brain babies have babies of their own while on low cholesterol diets themselves, it's no, it's anybody's guess what this, what the outcome of this ongoing experiment will be. So that kind of raises the point too. Again, we've been eating animal products for how many years now? It's like, you know, if you just keep starving yourself and then that affects your genes and then your kids and on and on, it's like, I mean, this, this does not end well. Um, and then I was going to get into a section, a section about other side effects. Did you have any more thoughts or comments before I continue? Uh. No, again, just decrying the uh, unfortunate nature of how limited our knowledge is on some of these things, but it's also positive as we are at a, it is rather, as, as President Joe Biden of the United States of America likes to say, we are at, at an inflection point in society where a lot of change is happening, where the future is very bright. Like, I honestly do think there's people who are going to be, who are born today, who will live to see like 300 years of their life. Just from the limited knowledge that I have, and I could be completely wrong in some, but it seems like there's enough knowledge. And then thinking of the advancement of technology and med, especially when you come to medicine and things like that, it makes sense to think somebody could find a way to extend this. this at least I, I haven't seen any convincing details to, to that shows like the effect of aging, which is just like your body not being able to continue replicating your cells, it just lo loses gas after a while, this, yeah. the, this wears out. There's no reason that that process cannot be continued find ways to make that continue. Like we already know there's certain people that you can see, these people are relatives and might be brother and sister. There might even be some twins where you get to a situation I get when it gets into the biology, the twin studies, probably better if you do cloning to see like, okay, this person has lived on earth for the same amount of years, but has a long, there was a simple test that was done. That one, uh, that one, uh, the two astronauts, one of them, I think the Kelly brothers, one of them went to space for like six months and then the other one stayed on earth or something where it was like a year and they came back, the one who stayed on earth was like shorter and they, they tested some aspects of their body and actually seemed like one of them had aged at a different rate. So there's, there's, there's so many interesting things in there, but yeah, um, with some of these things, some people are well-meaning, some of the things they don't understand, like epigenetics, I don't think, I still don't think the average person, even the average first world person with a college education could really understand what epigenetics is, which is this, those changes that happen in your genes, like switches can be turned on and off while you actually are alive. And some of those things are passed on to your children, but those can be turned on and off again. And they, they aren't as, stay, like you, I'm not gonna be able to like turn on and off blue eyes 
in my life where like my eyes will turn blue for some reason, even, but I might have some genes in my body that if you have, you pass them on to your kids, they might have the blue eye gene turned on. It, it, it's not those kind of genes. There's other sorts of genes. Uh, what's a good example of an epigenetic one? I can't really think of one off the top of my head. Uh, it's it's hard to say. Um, she has some stuff in the book. I'll get into the ne in the next section. But they wondered if there's if the vegetable oils are in any way uh, causing autism because it has to do with certain mutations that occur. Then how does that affect, you know, the parents, which in turn that gets passed on and all that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not super well versed on this stuff, so I don't really have too much to add. I mean, it's an interesting topic for sure, but like I don't I don't know enough where I could like comfortably speak on it. So. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has studied epigenetics or knows this kind of information, let me know in the comments. This is stuff that I really, I really like epigenetics and like evolutionary psychology and human behavioral biology. So it's, so it's, it's a side thing completely. I'm completely neophyte on it, but I'm just, I, I enjoy that stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. all right. So we can go to the other side effects. All right. So cooking with the oils kills the nutrients and, you know, Shanahan and others emphasize that a lot of fried food tastes good, but that's because of the other stuff. Like we have we have our flavor receptors to get certain nutrients to our body. Like we need salt. That's why salt is good. Uh, sugar, obviously, the carbohydrates. Um, bitter, they say um, certain bitter foods are nutritious, but also to ward off potential poisons because some poisons are bitter as well. Also, um, the, crispy, the crispy aspect, the crispy mouthfeel of fried foods is also does yeah, pleasant. Yeah. Yeah, and she explains that's basically the free radical cascade caused on the outside of the items, which is like you know kind of scary in oh, reality. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then of course, well, then of course, add on if you add like MSG or sugar, salt, like you know that's why like like a lot of like the Chinese fast food is basically fried food with sugar. It's like that's why it's good because it's those things. Um, you know, sugar, salt, MSG. It's like you know combined that tastes good. So uh, longevity, there's the famous eyes, Ivan France in the Minnesota study. They used 9,000 people in mental institutions. Uh, done 1968 between 1973. It was finally published in 89. I don't know why he waited so long. Um, there's some videos on this. Basically, people in mental institution, some were given uh, margarine, others were given butter. And they saw the people who had uh, margarine, there was no increased longevity. Um, there was no... Uh, there's no real positive impact from this. And they make the point this is an institution, so it's like they control what they're eating, like unless someone were to smuggle food in or something, but that usually doesn't happen. Um, you know, some people push back against this, saying this was decades ago. How relevant is it? I would argue it's an example of a controlled study because you know what they're eating, whereas if you just poll people, people can lie, exaggerate, or whatever about what they eat. Um, Birth defects in 2006 it was shown babies born with congenital spine and heart defects were found to have suffered from oxidative stress, again, caused by the oils. They think acne. I mean, I noticed my skin clears cleared up a lot when I stopped eating them because they wonder about being, you know, pushed through the toxins being pushed through your skin and how does that react to your body and that creates problems. They have wondered about a connection between skin cancer, which I wonder about as well because they talk about skin cancer used to be rare and why is it in recent years people have been getting it. And they've wondered about again being pushed through your skin. Um, the sun reacts, creates certain free radicals which causes this. Uh, the oils make you crave sugar. When your body senses them coming, a chemical called 2-AG is created, which causes you to overeat and not healthy items. Um, again, I wondered if this could be the connection to me dropping alcohol because, like, you know, alcohol is – your pancreas can't tell alcohol and sugar apart. So I'm wondering if because I cut them out, you know, the cravings went away. Um, they actually said taking in THC – I think everyone here knows what THC is from uh, <laughs> marijuana – it's uh, it was actually um, THC is actually in a prescription drug called uh, dronabinol, which is used for eating disorders. So like, I guess if someone's starving themselves or they won't eat, they give it to them to induce eating. Um, and there's a strong connection between sugar, inflammation, and insulin resistance, diabetes, heart issues, etc. My mom talked about how uh, when she cut out the oil, she said her junk food cravings disappeared. So again, that's an anecdote, but you wonder something to that. Um, one friend made the comment too about a lot of the junk food companies. Um, they they don't they they sell food that they don't want you to get full of, which makes sense because if you're hungry, you're going to keep buying more food. And I've thought about like not just how bad the food is, but like they pointed out how the portions over time have gotten bigger and bigger. Like if you look at like hamburger and fries from the 50s versus now, it's like they're a few times larger, and it's like. But people will eat all this and still say they're hungry, and you wonder, well, between the sugar and this, it's like you're not feeling full, so it stimulates your appetite and eating more. Mm -hmm. Whereas 
if you ate like potatoes and beef, you know, grass fed, cooked in tallow, you'd be full after a small portion. You're not going to overeat. So I think there's something to that as well. Uh, there's something they talk a lot about the microbiome health. And they wonder about the leaky gut because I noticed when um, when I cut when I cut out the oils and I started having bone broth and other things, I got this like warm, soothing feeling in my stomach. And some people say that's actually your stomach healing itself, uh, and that affects the brain and immune system and all that. Like a lot of the dopamine and serotonin is created in your stomach, so they mm. often call the brain the second gut. So if your stomach's out of whack, that affects your mood as well, um, and again, immune system and other things too. Uh, the oils react with items in the stomach, particularly iron-rich ones as I touched on above, such as red meat, which turn into oxidative products. So it's possible that red meat with the oils could be bad because they're reacting in a negative way. Um, this can cause heartburn, gastritis, ulcers, and cancer. And um, what's interesting is she and a few others make the point that heartburn being caused by uh, spices is actually a misconception. It's that the oil damages your stomach lining, which makes your stomach more sensitive so that the spices, you feel the impact of them in your stomach. I made the I made the comparison. It's kind of like if you get a cut or a burn and you're working in a kitchen, you're near a hot stove. The heat feels a lot worse because those nerves are exposed. It's a similar thing with your stomach. It's not the spices are burning your stomach. It's the nerve endings and things are exposed, which makes the pain feel a lot worse. So I think there's something to that as well. Um, and I've no, I noticed too, as well, since I cleaned up my diet, I'm getting fewer digestion issues in the stomach. My stomach doesn't burn like the way it did before. Mm -hmm. um, they harm the micro, they harm the microbiome and they limit the bacteria, the good bacteria. For example, if your gut is healthy and you have salmonella, your body will actually fight, potentially destroy it. If your gut health is bad, it won't do that. So my friend who has the raw milk farm talked a while ago about how um, they did an experiment where they had raw milk. They put a strain of salmonella and the healthy bacteria actually destroyed the salmonella. Oh, wow. And and they were saying that healthy bacteria, if, it, if your body and the milk is in such a state, it'll kill the bacteria. But again, if your body's out of whack, it's not going to do that. Um, I mean, let's just pause there for a second. That's, that's actually something that's, that's rather it's rather fascinating, just like human beings. It's actually because our organs can actually exist for some time without the rest, without being part of the organs. It's like a group of things. Like what's that creature? The Portuguese man of war is like a creature. It's like seven different creatures that come together to create one creature. And one's kind of acts like the stomach. One counts as like the sensory aspects of it. But they can sort of exist for some time, I think even for a long time without them. But our bodies like that. We have organs, we can switch organs in and out and things like that. So I'm saying with this kind of future thing, eventually you might be able to switch out all the organs that are ailing and then you're, you have entirely new organs from different genetics. How long does it take for your body to, like if you have, if you're, I saw this one really awesome video of, um, I think it was like a, it was either like a white family that somebody donated from a black family and that, that person who donated the heart died and then they had the, the, the brother or sister or relative come and hear the heart or that had been donated. Now is that heart a, a white white woman's heart or because it was but it was initially born into a black male's body? Like how long does it take for the genes and things like that to switch that out? So it's, it's kind of like if you tested that in 50 years, would you still get some genetic markers that this is a this is a, a Negro male <laughs> from the actual like heart? Okay, some of you were like, what are you doing? You're completely wrong. So I was completely wrong. I checked. Nothing changes. The organ stays the genes of the human that it came from, and the human has their own genes and actually treats the organ as a foreign object. So unfortunately, you still have to be taking a lot of drugs to make sure your body doesn't reject that organ and just kick it out of your system. And you can see why there's a lot of interest into growing organs from stem cells and other ways that match the actual person. And on the science fiction and things like this, there's certain storylines where people will have clones so they can harvest organs if they need them. Heart tissue, or would that completely switch? So there's, there's those considerations, but it's just amazing like with bacteria, there's like living creatures that live within inside us that help us exist and break down different things and give it to ourselves. And just the, the, there's so much to be just amazed about just understanding what life is, what the human organism is, what our fellow earthlings are. It's, it's kind of cool stuff. Yeah. And we learned too in school that people use bacteria like it's a bad thing. No, bacteria yeah. can be good or bad. A pathogen is a bad thing. A pathogen is what causes the sickness. It's like, it's like what we said above about like, Lipids, lipids are just oils and fats. They're not inherently bad. I mean, we're doing a whole discussion why seed oils are bad, but obviously olive oil is beneficial. The other fats, I'd argue, are beneficial. So it's like 
it, it, like in cholesterol too. I mean, cholesterol plays a vital function. It's like people have to realize like these aren't the boogeymen that they've been made out to be. It's just a question of the amounts, how they're utilized, et cetera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we go. So it doesn't stop with the stomach. It's been shown a diet high in linoleic acid consumption caused ulcerative col uh, colitis, a disorder which can cause bloody diarrhea and even require the colon or parts of it to be removed. Um, I was noticing, like, for example, I used to get some pain occasionally, especially when I ate a lot of these rich meals with oils. I would get pain in almost like my appendix area. But since I uh, since I cut those out, uh, that's gone away. Like, I haven't experienced that in a long time. And they're saying it's actually not the appendix. It's actually the intestine itself being inflamed. And if it gets too bad, if it gets too bad, you can actually need part of it removed. So uh, um, higher up in the uh, Libertarian Party, she actually had to uh, – she was on a diet and she said her intestine was damaged and she cut this out. I think she went carnivore actually. And they said the damage reversed itself. So she didn't have to have any intestine removed. And uh, Tucker Goodrich, one of the sources did have part of his intestine removed. And he said he cut the oils out. His health improved dramatically. And now if he, if he eats anything with the oils, like he actually feels pain in his intestine again. So they think it's irritating the area that was removed. Uh, so that's, you know, that's definitely something. Um, Again, like, uh, you know, that's, again, a few anecdotes, but, like, definitely notice the difference there. Um, general impact to arteries and blood flow. Uh, for men, they can actually cause erectile dysfunction as they impact blood flow and nitric oxide production. Um, it's kind of scary. She was saying if you eat too many of the oils, you can actually become permanently impotent, which is kind of scary because oh, wow. they damage – they, bland, they damage the blood vessels to a point where even Viagra won't help you. Like, that's a really scary thought. I mean – you know, maybe maybe down the road we'll get to a point with stem cells where they can grow new arteries or something, but it's like we're not there yet, so I wouldn't mess around. Uh, certain weightlifters and other performance uh, athletes actually have reported better lifting when they eliminated them, which makes sense because though if the oils reduce blood flow to the muscles in the brain and then you cut them out, well, more blood flow to the muscles, more blood flow to the brain, um, you know, you can do more reps but also better focus so they see better gains after, which makes sense. Um they can cause an overload of oxidative reactions inside the cells uh, of the brain. So that that kind of relates to what we said above about the heart attack. Uh, if it affects white matter, it affects your mobility. With gray matter, it affects personality, reasoning, skills, et cetera. Some believe this is at least partially responsible for Alzheimer's, the higher rates of autism, et cetera. And they negatively impact white blood cells as laid out above, which can trigger nerve de de degeneration and other issues because the white blood cells feed on the oxidated uh, – lipoproteins they die that brings others in that spreads throughout the cells and that can damage nerves arteries other things all right um you just get into the last section uh before did you have any thoughts or comments yeah no just an open for anybody else out there who has heard of any other conditions any other uh, side effects or things from uh the use of this and also if the, some of these you've seen something that proves one of these things that we've brought up wrong that there's no connection to it please let us know and I'll try to update if you leave the links in the comments or wherever you listen to this, I'll try to update it, update it in the linked document so we can have as, as valid information as possible out there to, to a certain extent. There's some of the things I might not be able to get to, but yeah, I'm going to try my best to, I'm going to try, not my best, my, my, <laughs> not try my best, got other things to do, but I'll try to update this and look in like uh, occasionally as, as this comes up. Yeah. All right, so just some concluding thoughts here. Um, so based on everything I've read and seen, these oils are something that should be eliminated entirely. Um, I wrote on my Facebook, like, they, they say everything in moderation. I, I push back against that. I would say the less, the better. No, I would say I the less, the better. I punch my face in, uh, in moderation. Like, I'm not, I'm not no. an MMA fighter. I, just, I, just, I, know, I know MMA fighters are like, yeah, you know, like, or some we're talking about with, like, the weak growth you're talking about, like, with your bone. Like uh, MMA fighters, they do like the mixed martial artists, they do like the shin kicking, especially like kickboxes and things like that. And there was, I think it was an MMA fighter went to train with kickboxes in Thailand and was like, did the, the, because shin kicking is now, leg kicking is now a common thing in MMA. It's becoming more popular. But if you're talking about like, they actually do tests, they actually do training where they're kicking their shins onto harder things. And then that, that builds up like the bone on the actual shins. I don't need that on my day-to-day -day life. I know it has a positive <laughs> effect in moderation for t Muay Thai fighters and kickboxers, but the average person shouldn't be advised to go out there and 
kick hard things on a regular basis to build up the calcium when they're in their shin bones. So that, that, that thing is, that's one of those nonsense sayings where it's like, it doesn't even sound good when you actually put, it's an annoying saying. Definitely you add that. It's an annoying saying series. But yeah, go ahead. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, even as someone who drank way too much before, I mean, I, I drink maybe once a week now and I was like, I mean, I still, I still enjoy wine pairings. I still enjoy beer, but for health yeah. reasons and also financial reasons. So it's like, you know, and then, then there are those studies saying that people who consume moderate alcohol have longer lifespans. But again, you have to look at, like, again, some of this longevity stuff's kind of loaded because it's like you have to look at what else they ate, how much did they exercise, how much did they really drink. Like, if you know, if you were like my grandmother and you exercise into your 90s, ate healthy, and had like a glass of wine like once during the holidays, yeah, you could say she drank moderately, but it's like, is it from the alcohol? Or is it from everything else? Like some of that stuff I'm a little iffy on. Same thing with the Mediterranean diet. Like, yeah, red wine on occasion, but if you're eating healthy stuff otherwise, you're walking everywhere. It's like, I don't know. It's it's kind of yeah. sketchy. Um, and then again, it's like polyunsaturated fat you can get from elsewhere. Again, the fish, you know, better for you, nuts as well. Um, I've switched to cooking with almost all beef tallow, uh, lard. I don't use lard too much. Christine doesn't like it, so I don't use it. Uh, duck fat, I'm a big fan of. Coconut oil, we both enjoy that. Uh, it does have a more prominent flavor, but it, it works nice with certain things. I actually had a cookie uh, from a place up the street, an oatmeal cookie made with uh, coconut oil is pretty good. So yeah, I was thinking about doing some... I was thinking about doing some uh, baking with coconut oil. It's pretty good. Um, avocado oil, uh, ghee or clarified butter. Um... I checked the labels and the ingredients to see if the oils are in them. I'm like, I was really amazed how many the oils are in so many things from like, you know, baked goods, dried fruit, um, you know, different breads, like pretty much everything. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, again, we had talked about it. There's the seed oil scout app. I really like, they keep updating it, which is good. Give, you know, gives good options. Um, there's also the Yuka app. The Yuka app is a more nutrition thing. Uh, generally, um, it's good because it, you can, I haven't used it much yet, but you can modify it based on dietary guidelines. So it'll say like, you know, this has a high amount of sugar because like you may not think there's sugar, but then it'll say this has this much in it. Uh, there's certain dyes there's certain preservatives that aren't good. So you can sort of like you can scan things and figure out accordingly. Like I bought some crackers that are rye and sourdough and it's just like water and there's no seed oils. So things like that that are like better for you. Um, and again, as I said earlier, is there anyone who, um, who went from like let's say the way I'm eating now to seed oils and did better. I mean, I have yet to see any, I see tons of people who've cut stuff out and um, seen benefits. Uh, again, like Tucker Goodrich said, there's a lot of anecdotes, but if all these anecdotes start piling up at some point, like we have to acknowledge there's an obvious trend here. Mm -hmm. um, and there could be some genetic elements here too. Like there was one, one source who was a bit of a skeptic said that, it's been shown that people with certain genetic markers, they get more issues with inflammation from them. So I, w I will acknowledge maybe there's some genetic thing at play. Um, yeah. And then it's also, okay, if you eat them in moderation, it's offset by antioxidants. Um, and then also too, some of the skeptics as well even said, like they don't think they should be cooked in things multiple times. And having worked in a restaurant, I can tell you, they don't change the oils every time they fry. They change the oils, they're new and then once they get really dark like depends on the place like a higher end place would change it more frequently but more casual they fry till it's almost black and then it's like okay that's when they change it and if it happens during a busy service you can't change till the end of the night so it's like you're frying food that has been cooked and all this stuff over and over all those things piling up especially being heated it's not good for you at all um again that's a little different from like a splash of oil in a food you're cooking at home versus cooking lots of stuff and soaking it up and you know um, and use fryer oil is actually used as biofuel, which would kind of make the question, like, is this stuff you really want? And then I cited a bunch of sources, which we could include links to uh, a bunch of different videos. Some of them, some of them, the information repeats, but like, uh, it's good to see people talking. Some of the people mm -hmm. uh, collaborated on some of the things. So it's good to see. Um, yeah. And I'm curious to see what you all think, if anyone's minds were changed, if anyone had any pushback, you know, it's, it was a really interesting topic. Uh, you know, something I'm living by now. And, you know, just curious to see what you all think, if there's any holes in this or how you'd answer this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Same here. I just want to like, send my thanks to Stephen. This is a bit of a rebirth. Yeah, okay. I just send my thanks to Stephen for doing this research. He's, he's taking this. I mean, there's something he was doing for his own life that we got in touch. And like, yeah, we had occasionally do these long conversations about various topics and it's stuff that we've been talking about um in private messages back and forth and he also shares a lot of things on uh, different social media 
Uh, as well as maybe we'll have links below if you want to follow him for that and other dissident content <laughs> that he puts out an occasional uh, addition of now uh, Boo Boo and what's the other what's the other bear's name? Oh, Boo Boo and Doo Doo. Boo Boo is the white <laughs> female. Doo Doo is the brown. <laughs> Some cute stuff there about that as well. We'll we'll, we'll bless your feeds on on various social media platforms. But yeah, so with that, uh, as same we well, reiterate what he said. If you have information that counters what we've said, please let us know. Also, we appreciate it if some of this stuff has helped you to make different choices in your life that you find positive, let us know. That's stuff that, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a terrible thing to hear. Hey, what you said kind of helped me out and I think it's improved my life. Um, yeah, it's also, it might even be better to hear like what you said was garbage and it's hurting people. That's you know, almost better in a way because we can maybe address the things that we said that were garbage and are hurting people and kind of, uh, I, I don't like taking stuff down but at least address it and say like, this is something that was wrong and I said it because I this and this in the past and not repeat that information again. So that that helps as well, yeah. Yeah, and, and like I say, I mean, we believe in freedom. People can eat what they want. I mean, I would just, I would highly recommend cut out sugars in these oils, uh, alcohol as well as I've done. Um, it was actually interesting recently, I, um, I, I was talking to some people about the connection between drinking and diabetes, and I was reading that the actor uh, Peter O'Toole used to actually drink excessively, and he actually had to have his pancreas removed and be on insulin the rest of his life. Oh, wow. um, and it was like that kind of scared me because I was thinking of like, oh, it used to be like, oh, I don't have that much sugar, but I was drinking a lot, and your pancreas doesn't distinguish. So, uh, like, you know. Uh, diabetes, as far as I know, doesn't run in my family, but I really don't want to tempt fate either. And I noticed, and uh, one of my friends did too, he's like, when I cut out drinking, I started getting cravings for sugar. Because for me, what happened was, uh, initially my appetite dropped because my body was burning fat, but I, like, I'm at a point, I've lost about 20 pounds, but I'm at a point now where if I don't eat, like I start getting hungry, especially for sugar. So I'm trying to moderate my appetite where I eat filling stuff so I'm full and then like stagger it so that way I don't snack throughout the day. Um, but there, there is something to this because it's like your body is either carb dependent or dependent on ketones. And it's like you have to essentially rewire your body. I mean, you know, you've done the keto diet, but you yeah. have to essentially your body has to be trained to sort of adapt to that new paradigm. And she's she's like, I guess, keto friendly. You could say Shanahan is um, she does like a modified keto. Um, but she explains like your body functions better on it, like better energy, mental clarity, all that. And like. I, I have noticed that as well since, again, part of that could be cutting out alcohol, but I do think the oils are a major factor too. Uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah, so I think that's as good a place as any to stop. We've shared the information that we have. If there's some significant information, might come back and add a different part of this. As we mentioned, might do one with sugar or alcohol, see if that might be separate enough. If you all want to hear one of those, let us know and Stephen might find the time to actually look into that information and uh, talk about that. And of course, you can also just be following Steve on the socials or follow wherever you listen to this because there's other conversations and things we can talk about and this is still something Stephen is living in, so it's part of his life. I'm also in a, on a journey of improving my, <laughs> my condition. Dropped off a bit on the whole dietary thing, gained some weight back, so I want to get back towards that and get in better shape. So just in a regular conversation about other topics, we normally just talk about our personal lives as well. So we can be updating you by just Stephen, like maybe in a conversation we have three months from now, I'm like, oh yeah, remember when you had that conversation? This is where I'm at now. Some of these things come up, but also we have this You Are What You Consume series where we talk specifically about foods, the food industry, like different kind of things that are related to that that this is meant to be a part of. So there's other food related topics that this will probably come up with in some way, shape and form in the relative near future. Or maybe by yeah. the time you listen to this, there's other things, but yeah. And I, you may have noticed too, I also do some of those short videos on uh, my Facebook page as well. And I was thinking about, uh, I did some stuff with seed oils with Christine, but I was thinking of doing some about uh, alcohol as well and the connection between mm -hmm. diabetes. And also some thoughts on uh, artificial sweeteners that I had because I've drank some of that stuff, but like the sodas flavored with it, but I've been reading some negative stuff about that as well. So, it, you know, it's tough because it's like you think, oh, I want sugar, you cut it out, but then your body just tries to get you to have other things that, uh, you know, are closed. So, you know, it's, it takes a lot of discipline and, you know, um, I went from 228 to about, I'm about 208 now, could lose a few more pounds, uh, but, you know, I'm proud of myself. I mean, it's definitely uh you know progress but um you know i'm trying to make these i always emphasize like it's not a diet it's a lifestyle change like i yeah. want to eat like this from now on not uh, and i have that debate with uh other friends and family members too like the whole 
oh, I'm on a diet, I lost weight. But it's like, no, but you just go back to the way you were. The whole point is that these are permanent habits, and then if you continue them, you'll have health long term. Yeah. And then also after some time, it's not simply just the scales, also body composition. These things kind of change around. Like we're not going to pretend that somebody who's like – Five ten, like three hundred pounds. Like somebody who's at five ten, three hundred pounds is the same as like Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal at five. That's seven, whatever, three hundred pounds. Seven like, two, yeah. I think I read. Yeah, yeah. you're gonna understand that because an entirely different, entirely different of like a body composition between those two people, and that, that you're gonna have to consider. So for each person, there's going to be a varied range of what's what's fitting for you and things like that. So that's something that, and as I mentioned, it's a great time to be alive because this information is there. Chances are you have more options than you think for your actual um, intake for the food that you can consume. And yes, one of the things I like reminding people is some of these questions and things that you might think, okay, this costs a bit more. Better physical health is going to reduce your future costs. Like uh, I think Thomas Sowell has pointed this out. Like when you talk about some of the medical costs in the United States of America, this is another thing. That's going to change medical costs. One of, the, one of the things is, of course, research and development. The United States of America is a research and development hub for like 90% of the medicine in the world and things like that. I think it might have changed now that China and some European countries are starting to change, but the majority of that's done there. Another difference is in the United States of America, 90% in general of people's medical costs are within the last year of their life because they're on their deathbed and they're getting yeah. all these different tests and things that are maintaining their life at that point. In a developing country, somebody with that same condition won't have access to all those other the, the, the CT tests, the the, the um, material holding him on a life like for for like six years, six months, and extending it with all the medicines and things like this. And I'm not saying that's an invaluable time of somebody's life, but that's not an option to somebody. So in a developing country, that cost won't even come up because the second they have that condition, they're going to pass away relatively early into that. So some of the things to kind of consider when you look at those things. Yeah, but, and also with that entire medical health industry, look at the people who are profiting from the system that it is. Why are those people profiting? And are you trying to request like the that issue to be fixed, those prices to be dropped by the same people who are profiting or were responsible setting the conditions for those people to profit in that means as well? And that's something that I think we have seen relatively clearly that there are some people profiting and benefiting from the system as is. And some of these very same people I'm a bit skeptical about the, is, are they just waking up to the new knowledge and changing? Or is it a thing where it's like they're pivoting without taking responsibility for their past thing into something that's like, oh, the actual solution is dropping this completely, but we know that will cost us. So let's have you, like you mentioned, on something that's just not as bad. And without, without admitting that maybe it's time to just not have this at all and move to something else entirely. So that's, yeah. That's and I, I think, and, and like I keep saying, I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's just people acting in their self-interest. Like, Oh, how do we use cotton seeds? Oh, well, we, we're going to throw them away. Wait, if we grind them down, we can make a lubricant for cheap and we can even mm -hmm. use it as fuel. Then, Oh, this kind of resembles lard. Let's cook with it. And then, okay, you know, people are waking up to this. Let's sell coconut oil. And, you know, then if enough people buy coconut oil, maybe they'll phase that out. It's again, it's just like, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they're businesses. They want to make money. You know, they're just going to do go where the money is. And also, you know, with the AHA, oh, we, we have a legitimate group that can put their stamp of approval on us and that we'll sell our products. So, yeah. you know, is that, again, we can question the ethics of it, but it's just, you know, people want to make money. People it's want life. to approve. Yeah. So it's a, people are responding to certain incentives and cost benefit analyses and like that tiger. <laughs> it's like, yeah. uh, that's a woman. I'm hungry. The tiger went tiger. The tiger didn't go crazy. I don't think people went crazy or like this, I, I'm not one with things like, I guess I disagree with the corporatist system that exists in the state with the ability to monopolize and get all this energy and the fiat currencies and all those things. A lot of other series that you can hear us talking about our disagreements with that kind of thing. But I also don't think it's just like, inherently evil people looking for the worst way to be waking up in the morning like today i'm gonna make sure as many people die from heart disease from consuming my products as possible and uh, ha 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 like it doesn't matter my kids are happy in their in their ferraris and flying around the world i don't i don't i don't think that that uh computes in people's minds no 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 okay so uh that's it for me anything else you gotta say to the people before we say goodbye that's all. Again, hope you enjoyed. Uh, please feel free to leave any feedback. Um, yeah, we can do something, I guess, sugar, alcohol, whatever. That could be an interesting discussion.
So all right. hope you enjoy. So guys, gals, and everybody else in between, thank you all for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.